no matter how good you think you are, how successful you are, there's always someone in different fields who just as successful or more successful, and you can be a really dumb person in another room as well. It's always a very romanticized version of it. Oh, I had struggled a little bit, then I had a you know, peak climax and a happy ever after, right? It's very kind of Hollywood structure to it. I'm not gonna do it the way that he asked me to do it. I'm gonna try my own way, different things. And all my friends are like, you're crazy. Why would we do that, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah stick to that assignment, man. What are you doing? He said, hey, uh, can we have breakfast tomorrow? And I was like, oh my God, this is my chance. This is it, this is an opportunity. I couldn't drink my coffee, so I just have to like put that coffee away because <laughs> I was so nervous. <laughs> This is Kamdidi featuring. My name is Vic and welcome to the show. Today I'm so excited for you, Candy fans who are watching this episode on YouTube or listening to this episode on your favorite podcast player. Because I'm about to talk to this great, talented person, a full Thai person who until recently has been working abroad for 17 years. He's this great person who got great job in Singapore, very high up very influential and very successful as the group chief economist slash MD at C Group. So one of the biggest unicorns in ASEAN, you know, ROV, Shopee, ring any bells. Yeah, all those. And yet he is very, very humble and super nice and very pleasant to talk to. I'm sure uh, we can learn a lot from him today on this episode. And also he's got an opportunity to work with a lot of people from different countries, different cultures. So I think it might be fun to pick his brain and see and understand um, about different perspectives. And maybe we'll get to see why Singapore is so ahead of us. What do they do that we don't? Or it's not because that we don't, but we can't. We'll find out about that too. And finally, although he's very young and full of energy, he just decided to quit that great job and retired back to the motherland, which is Thailand. And the question is why? I'm wondering too, why? So I'm gonna ask him why on this episode, why he decided to come back. And uh, one thing for sure, I think it's not because he got so lazy or so wealthy that he doesn't need to work or doesn't want to work anymore. He's got his plan and we'll get to listen and see what his plan is on this episode too. So please welcome Dr. Santitan Satien Thai or Kun Ton Son. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for having me, Kathy. You're, you're too kind. The introduction. Uh, yeah, I mean every word. <laughs> Thank <laughs> because you. Because we, we you. talked before, and I can tell that this interview is going to be great, and I'm going to have so much fun talking to you today. That's great. Well, that's a lot of pressure, actually. <laughs> <laughs> a, a, a healthy kind of pressure, uh, yes, I hope. Yes. Okay, so in most of your interviews, um, you always talk about what you think or what the facts are but not so much about yourself. So hopefully we'll get to know who you are in English on this episode of Comedy Featuring. Okay, so first of all, how are you doing, you and your family? So, and and how, how long has it been since you came back to Thailand? Well, this is my fifth day um, in Thailand, uh, mm. this time moving the whole family back. Mm. Uh, as you said, I've been living abroad uh, 17, 18 years working abroad um, and been living in Singapore for the past 13 years. Right. Um, the family has been there. Uh, mm -hmm. My two kids were born um, in, in Singapore as well. Yeah. So they're essentially a global citizen. So their mm -hmm. first time moving back to Thailand, yeah. their ties are not great at all. Yeah. Um, so to them, it's not moving back. It's moving away from there. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's the first move. It's not really right. moving back. I, yeah. we, we try to convince them that it's actually moving back, but they, they, they're not so convinced. <laughs> <laughs> and there are like seven and six? Yeah, seven and a half and, and six. Okay. Yeah. So they're about to uh, enter the first grade, I think. Yeah, they kind of year, one of them is year three and one of them is getting year two. I see. Um, so they're in the English uh, international school system. Okay. 
Yeah. All right. So a lot, a lot of things, uh, a lot of changes we are we're mm -hmm. handling. Um, bags are not fully unpacked. Mm -hmm. All our boxes uh, are not here yet. Um, <laughs> okay. That's going to be a lot of big things to sort out. Yeah. So I think a lot of excitement. We can yes. see it that way too. Yes. Yeah, yes. Excitement. Exciting. Like changes. Excitement. Um, mm -hmm. Nervousness. Yeah. So <laughs> are, the, are, are you usually good with changes? Uh, no, not that great. No. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a person who likes to likes to know where we're going, like we have plans and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But that said, very interesting. Um, I'm also the kind of person who, who every now and then like to disrupt myself. Um, and I actually didn't really know this about myself until recently, until I look back in my life. Um, I'm, I'm working on an, another book where I have to kind of look back a uh. little bit. And I kind of realized that actually that's true. Every five, six years or so, I tend to find ways to disrupt my own mm. life in different ways. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of a repeated cycle that mm. I've been doing. So I don't like changes in general, but then at certain juncture, I will, I will choose to, to have a big disruption in life and make yeah. big changes and uh -huh. embrace all the you know, scariness and everything that, that comes yeah. with that. Yeah, I totally can resonate with that because my cycle is 10 years. Oh, Almost right, every right, 10 years, right, something right. big happened to my life. And at oh. first, I was kind of like, ah, no, I don't want to change anymore. But I ended up like feeling good about the changes almost always. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. So changes exactly that. Yeah. are not that scary if we don't let them to be, I, yeah. I guess. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And mm -hmm. I, I think there was a one or two episodes as well where if you kind of linger on and, and stay on and refuse to change, that actually the lack of change become more scary, uh, scarier yeah, oh, yeah, than yeah. the change itself. You know, you kind of start to feel like, actually, why, if you, if you feel stuck. You don't feel uh, comfortable anymore. It becomes stuck in, in a place. And I think that's a really scary feeling for me yeah, as well. Yeah. So I think changes sometimes is, is great. And changes sometimes help you uh, keep true to yourself. Because mm -hmm. sometimes the way that um, you, you also change over time. So in, in order to kind of keep being yourself, being true to yourself, sometimes you have to change the way you do things. That's true. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, do you talk about your childhood a lot? Anybody asked you about? Um, Here and there sometimes. Not, yeah. not, not, not a whole lot. Yeah, I was yeah. wondering uh, yeah. what was Dek Chai Tun Son like when he was like very little? Like when he was five and he was 10? What was he what's like? like? What was he like? Um, I think that those questions better ask my friends because they might <laughs> say different things yeah. <laughs> or my parents. Uh -huh. But what, what I can say is this. I, I think what has been very transformative for me is I changed school a few times. Uh, and it's not because I got kicked out. Okay. <laughs> no, not because of okay. that. But uh, I think high school years in particular was, um, so I was Sati Jula uh, for, you know, up until um, Ma Song, so Ma Tu. And, and, then, and then after that, went to international school, Bangkok Patna for two years, uh -huh. and then went to England uh, boarding school for two years, right. and then university. Mm -hmm. I think those shifts uh, has been very important drivers in my life because it, it, cha it, it changes everything. This is back in the days where there were no internet. Yeah. Uh, it's very hard to kind of come back, you know, mm -hmm. contact, get in touch with people. Um, there are not that many Asian students in yeah. school um, yeah. in, in the UK back then. Uh, boarding school is very different. So a whole experience, the whole chief uh, was a big, big thing. But I think one thing that it really helped me is that I learned how to be the winner as well as how to be a loser oh. in different ways. Because you could be really good at something in your old school, have great friends, have great uh, social life and everything. Then when you achieve school, you kind of press reset. Um, in a language of today, you unlearn. You unlearn a lot of things. Um, you might be really good in, in, in Thai language and everything, but once you shift to English, different culture, different standards, th those, those are no longer your game. You're playing a different game. Sure. And you start from the beginning again. Hmm. Um, so you become like a, like, a, like a loser. You become like a, a beginner again uh, from zero. And then you build yourself back up, um, you know, gain your confidence, uh, find your own ways. Mm. And then you disrupt yourself again. Mm. And, you know, maybe looking back, that's where all this cycle disruption came from originally was that because in, when I was younger in my childhood, I also went through similar things. Mm. Um, so you, you, went, you can go from being the smartest person in a room to be the dumbest person in a room yeah. and going climbing back up and then doing back and forth in different things. Mm. But I think it's a great experience because I think that's true in life too, that, that you, you kind of build your resilience, yeah. that kind of growth mindset, you know, yeah. that 
even though you think how, no matter how good you think you are, how successful you are, there's always right. someone um, in different fields who are just as successful or more successful, um, and you can be a really dumb person in another room as well. Mm. So those are like always struggles, aren't they? Like for especially teenagers, or especially for someone yeah. who hasn't found themselves yet in the world, like who I am and what am I here for, or what am I good at? And uh, whenever you learn how to be a winner, that's great, right? Mm. But you could get like a big head about it, and and then when you yeah. lose, <laughs> you could be uh, super like uh, suffering about it too. Yeah. So h- how how do you survive all that without um, going going bad or going? Um, to the way you're not supposed to go. So who, yeah. who got you or how do you guide yourself through all those wins and loses? Yeah, you know, it's a great question. Um, I think that cycles of going up and down in life helps a lot because when you're, uh, when you're a winner or when you're kind of on top of your game in something, you still remember what it feels like when you were also kind of, you know, not recognized or, or you're, you're still struggling and everything. Mm. So you have that empathy for other people mm. who, who are in that position. You also know that everything is relative, that um, I'm here now, uh, but actually, am I a very different person uh-huh. from who I was last year in a different place? No, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm similar. Maybe I'm a bit better at a few things, but I'm the same person. So it's really which environment you're in, which ecosystem are around you, what kind of friends you have, all of those things matter. So everything is relative. So you kind of let go of a few things that um, society may label someone as successful, uh, this and that. But at any event, you are you. Um, and you can be winner today, you can be loser tomorrow, you can be a different guy on the next day. It doesn't really matter. Um, you just have to be comfortable with being yourself. Mm-hmm. And I think, that what what helps with that a lot is have people surrounding yourself who are genuine friends and family mm. who are uh, I, I like this word um, they call sometimes they call the disagreeable givers I think it's coming from this book um, by Adam Grant Disable, disagreeable giver is someone who who disagree with you mm. uh, keep you grounded mm. um, because they care not just because they want to be pain in you know in mm. your life in mm. general. But they, they care about you. So when you get cocky, you get big head and everything, they will tell you like, hey, you know, what are you doing? Mm-hmm. What's happening with you? I don't like who you become mm-hmm. and things like that. And mm-hmm. kind of keep you grounded, right? Um, the danger always is that when you're rising, um, you're climbing up the ladder and everything, is that you lose some of these friends and mm-hmm. family. You, start, you stop listening to them because you said, oh, come on, I'm, I'm, I'm too good for you guys now, right? Mm-hmm. And when you, when you have that, you're going to have an echo chamber for yourself, who, mm. people who are just singing praise to you. And that's super, super dangerous. Yeah. Well, speaking of family and support, yeah. you've got a very famous father, of course, Dr. Thurki Zatien Thai. He used to be a deputy prime minister. He was the minister of foreign affairs. Yes. And at one point, he was a minister of finance. So yeah. was he a big influence to your life? I guess the answer is yes, but how? How much and how so? Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, of course, you know, growing up, great respect to to my father, but also my mother, mm. uh, my grandparents as well. They 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 are all great in, influence in my life in, in different ways. Mm-hmm. Um, but influence for my father is interesting. I think there's a direct influence about what he 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 teaches me. You know, what has been um, uh, showing me, um, explaining to me, um, mm. shaping me directly. Um, but there's a lot of indirect as well. Mm-hmm. Indirect as in that the society, the pressure they, they would put on me, like, oh, you know, your father is this, of course you have to do this, you have to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's really important too, mm-hmm. um, for someone in my position to kind of establish finding who you are and who you really want to be and not who society want you to be. I see. Um, and honestly, I think being abroad helps. Working abroad, uh, it's just, it, it depends on different person, right? Um, I know a lot of, different friends who take this different way. Yeah. But in my personal way, it was really important to go to some place where uh, I know that I can't just use my surname. Mm. I can't just use my family name to open doors. I have to go somewhere where I can build my careers, test myself, and be able to answer myself that, can I do it? Mm. I, as a, me as a person, as a Thonson, as Sanditan, you mm. know, how far can I go? 
yeah. and really prove yourself. Um, mm-hmm. And once you have done that, I think you kind of discover yourself. You're comfortable with yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that's a very big influence. Mm-hmm. Credit to my father. He never pressured me anything like that. Mm-hmm. He was like, oh, do you want to do PhD? I don't think you have to do it. You know, <laughs> He always said, this, it's a world of choices. You can do whatever you want. Uh-huh. Um, uh, but, so great. Yeah, but the pressure around you know, um, from different people is, mm-hmm. is, is real. Mm-hmm. So you can't deny that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and so it's important to kind of establish that for yourself, yeah. your own journey, your own yeah. story. So how long did it take you to find yourself, discover who you actually were? Long time, I think. Um, I think part of it, it's always been in the background uh, there. Uh, most of the time I was abroad. So it's kind of like, you know, missions of proving yourself that you can climb up the, the corporate ladder to become leaders in, 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 uh, uh, in the business world, in the financial mm-hmm. world. Um, having financial independence, mm-hmm. uh, earning income to feed a family, mm-hmm. uh, setting up the good path for them to you know, have a good education in the future, planning mm-hmm. for retirement. Mm-hmm. All of those things, I think, you w- was part and parcel of this. So you kind of see how far it can go. Yeah. Um, but at some point, I think the priorities start to shift. Mm. So it wasn't like black and white, like all of a sudden one day, it's like, hey, I'm done. I, <laughs> I, I'm cool with myself now. But it's more gradual. It's just other things become uh, more important as well. So mm-hmm. you start to shift from question about focusing on yourself, how much uh, I can, can, can I do, how far can I go, proving to myself, to thinking more about more outward looking to what can I do to contribute to my community, to my society. Um, now that I have gained all this knowledge, expertise, network, Um, can I do more? Yeah, I think most people um, almost like underestimate or uh, take for granted the that gradual process because mm-hmm. most of the time when they look at someone who's successful, mm-hmm. they only see like the end result of that person, yeah. but not the journey. Yeah. Or when they like watch movie, those like struggle process only yeah. takes like what 20 minutes in the movie, yeah. so they don't know the weight of you know the process, the whole process, the yeah. actual thing that actually happening to them, yeah. and maybe they can. Always, always feel like I'm not gonna get there, or why isn't things happening to me already? Yes. Have you ever feel that way? Sometimes? All the time, yeah. all the time. Yeah. Uh, you're absolutely right. Because you you look at the books and all this stuff, right? And 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 people's story. You look at the end point. It looks great. Right. And even when you tell the journey, it's always a very uh, uh, romanticized version of oh, it, yeah. right? Like, oh, I had struggled a little bit. Yeah. Then I had a you know, peak climax and happy ever after, right? It's right. very kind of Hollywood structure to it. Uh, when in real life, it's much more messy. Mm. You kind of try so many different things. Yeah. Um, it, it's not just failing. It's a lot of being lost as well. Mm. Right? I think sometimes we can deal with some failures. Like, okay, I'm trying this. I'm going to keep trying. Just you know, say you're a climber. I, I couldn't climb this mountain. I'm going to keep climbing. Okay, that's, that's difficult, but some way straightforward. But most of the time, you don't even know if you want to be a climber. It's mm-hmm. like, I'm going to try different things. I tried this, not quite. Tried this, maybe. I tried this, but there's setbacks. What am I? What should I do? I think that's the really tough part. The lo- being lost, um, being lonely. But I think that's very normal. And yeah. I, I think you all have to go through that. But it, it's hard to write about. And I understand, like, kind of here, you kind of, you don't want to be complaining about different, how many things I tried, right? Yeah. Um, no one wants to listen to that as well. So, <laughs> yeah, but I think that's a, Very normal part of the process, but um, there's a quote that that really helped me um, throughout my life. I still use it. I've been using it all along. It's life changing for me. Uh, from it says that uh, luck is when preparation meets opportunity. It's a very simple quote, but it's very powerful for me mm. because uh, every time I see people and I think, my God, they're so lucky, you know, to get to where they are. Um, when you look inside that, there's always an element of um, opportunity mm-hmm. that arises, but also the preparation that, that that they have been doing up until that point. Mm. So it could well be the case. Like uh, the, the picture that I have in my head is you're you're in a sea, right? You're you're trying to go forward and you swim over time, uh, and you're struggling um, against the tide, but actually. This quote reminds me that actually life is kind of like a surfboarding. You're a surfboarder, like you have a board, uh, holding a board in your hand. If you're prepared, 
and you always have a board in your hand, you always look out for the big wave to come, one day the wave will come. The question is, when the wave come, are you prepared? Have you been looking at it? Mm. Do you still have the board in your hand? Mm. If you do, you have all of that. You can actually go very far, very fast. Mm. And scientifically, there's a term for this. It's called nonlinear. Life is not a straight line. It's kind of sometimes there's a lot of period where it seems like nothing happened. There's no wave at all. But one day when it comes, it's so powerful beyond your, beyond your imagination. Mm. Um, so you have to wait for that. But don't just wait. Because if you just wait, it's like you're just swimming, you're just hanging out in the water, you don't have boards. When a wave comes, you can't catch it. So you have to always be prepared um, so that some, one day opportunity will come and you're ready to catch that wave. So I think that has helped me tremendously uh, at every point in my life where critical turns, when, when I got to the PhD program, um, when I uh, uh, moved to finance, got a job in finance, when I changed a job to tech, was all around because of this quote entirely. I totally agree with that. And, uh, but it cannot be like 50 and 50, right? Luck, mm, mm. Uh, when you mention luck yeah. and uh, preparation and opportunity. So yeah. which, which one do you give more credit to, mm. like according to your life and what you have done? Mm. Like you have more preparation or more like opportunity in, in your life? Preparation. 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 Yeah, you have yeah. to do a lot of preparation. Mm -hmm. um, that's the part you control more. Yeah. The opportunity, you don't fully control it. Mm -hmm. um, actually, like the wave, quite small. right? Yeah, like the wave. You yeah. can't really control it. There, there, there are some things you can do around opportunity that I, I learned over the years. Um, exposing yourself to different network, different society, different communities help increase. Because then you, you happen to sometimes stumble on someone that might know someone, might connect with someone. Mm -hmm. So the dots get connected yeah. and opportunity arise. But most of the time, what you can do is prepare it, especially when you're younger. When you're mm -hmm. younger, opportunity is, tend to be even less mm -hmm. under your control. Mm -hmm. So all you can do is just prepare and prepare and do your best and different things. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I, I wrote this in my, my first book. It was a good uh, illustration of this. So I got a chance to, so I applied, you asked about my father earlier. So one of the dream I, used, I had back then was um, because I, I was there when my father graduated um, from Harvard uh, PhD in law school. He's the only Thai that, uh, I think still is the only Thai that graduated Harvard Law School PhD uh, called SJD. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I was there in the Harvard yard, you know, when I was probably six, kind of my son's age right now, uh, just standing there uh, at a graduation ceremony, you know, he's him wearing gown. And I have that picture. And I think deep down, I always want to, my God, I really want it one day. I'm going to be there wearing a gown and my parents will be there, mm -hmm. right? Um, so always dream to kind of do, get, get a degree of Harvard, um, get a PhD there. Uh, of course, very difficult. Um, and I applied many times, I didn't get in. Uh, so it was kind of like my last attempt. And I, I was working with this, uh, Nobel Prize uh, economist uh, in New York. And I know that if I manage to impress him and he write a good recommendation for me, that would increase my chance quite a lot. Um, it was, but he's so busy. I have about two, three months working with him and he's never around. Uh, it's not his fault. I mean, he's, he's you know super famous yeah. guy. Um, so he travels all the time. So he kind of assigned me some work and was like, hey, you work on this. Um, you know, I'll come back and look at it. And they keep postponing the meeting. And, you know, all my friends and people who kind of work with him said like, oh, I just, you know, he's like this, don't worry about it. You know, you've done what he asked you, right? Then just chill, just enjoy New York. You know, so many <laughs> things here, you know, here's yeah. uh, West Village, here's uh, Upper East Side, whatever it is. Uh -huh. I was like, okay, great. Um, but then to me, I, I took that opportunity and said, okay, the opportunity never really came. But, you know, what if, it, what if he comes up and he called me one day and say, hey, you know, Saitan, come and uh, 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 let me see what you have done. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'd done what he said, but I feel like, I feel like there's, there, there are more things I could do. So I decided to took my own way. I was like, I'm not going to do it the way that he asked me to do it. I'm going to try my own way, different things, oh. right? Because I'm guessing that I think this is what he wants. Um, but the, his way may not be the best. I think I might have another way. 
I'm just gonna try this. And all my friends are like, you're crazy. Why would you do that, you <laughs> yeah. know? Right? And um, and how uh, also they might feel like, you know, why, why would you think you could know better than the yeah, Nobel Stick to the assignment, yeah, man. Yeah, stick to the assignment, man. Yeah. What are you doing, you yeah. know? Uh, so I, I kept doing that, and but but I was I was not that confident about it. So I did, and I kind of keep in this kind of blue folder, and you know that's it. Okay. And then it, it happened kind of just right before the end of the work uh, opportunity the internship thing. Um, um, the the guy uh, he he called me up and said, "Hey, uh, can we have breakfast tomorrow?" And I was like, "Oh my God, this is my chance. This is it. This is an opportunity." Yeah. I was super nervous. I went to the uh, this restaurant um, at cafes with him, having down breakfast. I ordered, you know, big coffee. Uh, then I realized that I I, I pour in uh, a lot of sugar because I try to kind of get myself a boost, but it turned out to be salt. What? Because <laughs> I was so nervous. So yeah, I could, how nervous you were. I couldn't drink my coffee, so I just have to like put that coffee away. All right. Uh, so I'm also like pretty, you know, don't have my my, my needed coffee and everything. Not up to a good start. Not up a good start at all. I presented what he wanted me to do to him. Then he was like, okay, yeah, that's all right. But not you know, super impressed. Not you super impressed. Not super impressed. Okay. And he was like, um, but you know, he didn't blame me as well. He's like, well, you know, maybe my method didn't work out so well. So okay. he's very nice about it. Mm -hmm. um, then he kind of like talked about, oh, so what are you doing after the, well, after the opportunity? So kind uh -oh. of like wrapping things up, yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, I was like, my God, this is only 30 minutes into breakfast, you know? Uh, uh, this is a disaster. Uh, then I realized, like, uh, and he said, oh, uh, Sayon, do you have something else for me? Um, I said, you know what? I do. Uh, I have this blue folder stuff. You know, let me take it out. I took it out, and then I explained to him. You know, I I I tried. You know, my watch shaking. Like, I tried this way. I'm not sure if this right. I think it's probably wrong. But can you look at it? Uh -huh. uh, and then he looked at it, went quiet, and it was like, wow. It's like you did this yourself. It's like yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I was like, wow, this actually might be something. And he was like, okay, um, we can work on this. And I said, do you know what? I have to fly to Manchester in the UK tomorrow. Can you come with me? So you can talk me about this Whoa. through this. I was like, oh my God, yeah, sure, of course. And then we talked and you know, the breakfast went on for two hours. Wow. Um, I went back, had to find, uh, they did get me a flight to fly with him, uh, carrying his bag around <laughs> in, in Manchester, um, just to talk to him. Uh -huh. And yeah, no, it went well. He wrote me a recommendation. Um, I got into in, in a, uh, Harvard the PhD program, and that I wanted. The the the, the work in that blue uh, folder became my master degree thesis, which earned me uh, an award for best dissertation. Wow. I used the same one to got a scholarship for a PhD in Harvard. Um, and that that was part of my PhD thesis, and, wow. and that, that 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 changed everything around. So, luck was when all that preparation, waiting for that one opportunity that just came, that one breakfast, and that one question that asked, "Do you have something else for me?" And then preparation, aka the blue folder. The so blue folder. Yeah. Always have your blue always folder. Always have your blue ready. folder. Yeah. Wow. And it repeats, this kind of thing repeats doing the, you know, I, I don't want to bore everyone, but it's doing the same thing when it got into the finance, uh, I got applied, I got rejected so many times at the tech part, very similar things happen. And the funny thing is, is that when, when all this thing happened, I remember the blue folder and I knew that, oh, this is, you know, when it, the, dark, the tunnel seems so dark, I remember that there's always a blue folder that I should prepare because someday the light may come and then I have to do something about it. And, and because of that lesson, it keep repeating itself every now and then. And it, it really changed my life. Yeah. It has become a pattern. It becomes a pattern. Yeah, yeah, that keep recurring yeah. in your life. That's a great story. And I think that is something that we can totally actually use. So yeah. most, most of us don't even think about the blue folder because extra work, right? Yeah. Why do we have to do like extra work while yeah. we have like great assignment from a Nobel Prize laureate? Yeah. Like, yeah. Wouldn't dare think anything outside of right. that, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. I, I really think it sounds crazy for you to like do something else yeah. uh, besides the assignment itself, but it turns out to be a lifesaver for you. Yeah. yeah. You know, you use the word crazy. It's really interesting. Um, I thought about that a lot. 
uh, because my friend said that to me. <laughs> so I hadn't thought about it. But then, but then I, I flipped it around. And I, I, I remember telling this to myself that actually, you know what's crazier? What's crazier is to have this great opportunity to work with Nobel Prize and to not try everything you can, everything, to kind of capture and seize this opportunity. That's even crazier than having the blue folder. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that was a lot of things that, that in my life as well, kind of like, you know, it's crazier to not change. It's crazier to, 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 to not try your best and do everything you can to achieve something. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what preparation is in my definition. Yeah. yeah. So status quo, not your thing. Doing things that yeah. as like it is, it was. Yeah. I, I, think, I, I think you have to have that, to be honest. Um, if, if you imagine you are, you're, if, if imagine life as a kind of you're driving a very long journey, I think these are the kind of the key crossroads you have to make, make yeah. right? You have to make the right turn. But, but, but there are times when you're not at a junction, you're not at a crossroad as well, and you're just on a normal straight road and you have to drive. Mm -hmm. I also know people who, who sometimes do the opposite, also not, not, not healthy, where they, they're driving, but they're always looking left and right. I was like, mm -hmm. oh, is, can I turn here? Can I change that? Yeah. Then you never really put in the work, right? Because uh -huh. you're always looking to jump ship all the time. <laughs> That's not great too. So there, there are times in life where you just have to grind it. You just have to do it. Mm -hmm. um, drive on that road and do your best. Yeah. But then always there's a time when you have to kind of slow down and look for the right crossroad that made the right turn as well. So yeah. life is about balancing the two things, in my view, at least, my humble opinion. Yeah. Uh, and, and getting that mix right is, is an art. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, when we talked last time, uh, talking about driving analogy, so you used to say something along those lines of like, you kind of uh, compare yourself as the F1 driver who has been racing yeah. all, his ri all his life uh, at full speed. And this is actually the first time you hit the brake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's, let's talk yeah, more about that for our right. audience. That's right, that's right. Oh yeah, absolutely. So I think a lot of people uh, in, in similar position as I kind of work, uh, especially when you work abroad, um, I, I think this is different. Um, when you work as an expat in, in different countries, you, you know it's not your home, even though how, how comfortable you are. So you, you feel like you, have, you don't have the right to be there unless you're good, right? You don't have the birthright. So, so you're in the foreign land. If you don't have jobs, you're not good at what you do, they're gonna send you home or you, you don't have money to live there. So, so you always have to kind of prove yourself. You always have to kind of move forward. Um, um, so you end up driving very fast if you compare, you know, you're setting an, an analogy. You're always F1, you, you keep going, going, going. Um, and when you drive very fast like that, you don't have a lot of time to kind of look around, around you. So you don't really know where, where you are. You just keep focusing because the car is going so fast. Um, and it's amazing um, the kind of things that, that you, you're locked into that, that life very fast and life would just flash past you by. Um, what I realized is that if you have time to slow down, um, you start to see a lot of things better. You start to have things like, for example, you start to see outside your window, like, oh, actually, it's a pretty nice view outside. You know, it's very nice green here, then, you know, where, where we are. Um, you might end up in a place you like or you don't like, but then you realize, like, where you are. Um, you start to realize who's sitting in a car with you. <laughs> so your family, your kids, your friends. Um, you start to pay more attention to the person who's right in front of you, which I think is really uh, an understating. It's so important. Um, and then you start to have a think about you know, where you are in a, on a map, in the big grand scheme of things. Where am I going? Where's my life going? You know, I have done this, I've done this. And once you have done all of that, it's amazing. Um, you get a perspective and you start to ask all these questions. And that's when you get to this, you know, making the right turn at the crossroads and the juncture. So that, that's, that, this is the first time I, I, I do that uh, fully. In the past, I slowed down a little bit around the where the point I changed my life, but I never slowed down this much. Mm -hmm. So this time is the first time it's like, hey, I'm just gonna come back to Thailand. I'm going to uh, not do full-time job. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna ta start a, take a new phase of life where I see where life takes me. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna have a few portfolio of jobs around, um, mm -hmm. not just one. Mm -hmm. uh, we can talk more about it later. Um, but I'm just gonna plan to not have a plan. 
Oh, that's nice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and and it is. It could be very hard for some people because it's their nature to plan things. Yes. Right. Yes. And was it yes. in yours, na- your nature? Very hard. I'm struggling as we speak. You know, <laughs> even when after I say that, I uh-huh. feel like shaking a little bit. Like, <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. Really. Uh-huh. Really. <laughs> yeah. Okay. No, it, it's it's hard. What I can say is slowing down. Uh, is great. I think it gives you uh, to focus on yourself and your family, people around you, yeah. think about your life more. Mm-hmm. Um, what that might take you, I think, is different for different people. For me, I think having that this uh, slowing down and having a bit of a break and change the approach to my life, um, having a plan to not get everything planned out, I think that's helpful yeah. uh, for me. Um, and yeah, no, I think it's 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 going to be fun. Uh, mm-hmm. But also like a bit quite nervous as well. Yeah, yeah. I asked you once uh, in our last conversation, and I'm sure a lot of people want to ask you this: Is that what are you going to be doing now that you have moved back here for good? And mm-hmm. you, you told me that you want to see three kind of connections happening. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah you want to talk yeah, more about that? That's right. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So on one hand, is about not having everything planned out, right? Not having your path planned out. But on the other one, I think you still need to have like a compass, like a broad compass, whereas you're north, right? Um, and I think my mission, or kind of my north uh, star, is uh, three things that I want to do next phase in life. Number one, I want to connect Thailand to the world and the world to Thailand more. Um, having been living abroad for a long time, I think Thailand can benefit a lot from getting the views, learning from the world, and also the world can be learning from Thailand as well. So connect those, make those connection. That's one. It's very broad. It can be many things. Uh, number two is around connecting uh, different generations together. Uh, the young leaders uh, generation, um, the older uh, generation, the more senior generation, the senior leaders. Uh, I think there are a lot of generation gaps. I feel like I'm the middle generation, the same generation in between. And there's a lot of rooms for connecting different generations, which can be very powerful for society, uh, for organizations, for teams, for communities. Um, and thirdly, connecting people without opportunities, the underserved, to opportunities. Mm-hmm. Um, in some ways, I've done that through my, my role in kind of technology and different things. But I want to do more of that um, and, and, and reduce inequality, um, to, so to speak. So these yeah. are the three broad principles and yeah. anything I do from here on, whether it's the, the, the selection of jobs, portfolio of jobs I do, um, projects, um, writing, everything, it will f- have to fit these broad yeah. principles. So um, the second connection you want to help make is the connection between generations. Yeah. So yeah. what is... What is your take on each uh, generation <laughs> right now? Like looking at the teens these days, what do you see? What I see these days is interesting. Uh, it's gonna, I'm trying to think because this can get me a lot of trouble here from the inside. So, <laughs> okay, let's uh, see it. Oh, all right. Okay. So, so, so I've done some research on this. Yeah. So, so I, I took one of this uh, program called Rule of Law for Development, R-O-L-D. Um, and anyway, part of the group project that we had to do was um, kind of understanding the generation gaps. So I did a very interesting um, uh, kind of thought experiment. Mm. Uh, one of which is, I asked myself this question that, um, if we meet someone from other countries, right? Let's say I meet someone from, from England, from France, and we talk about politics, about democracy, about something which is, I don't know, now can be controversial stuff, right? Yeah. Um, and they have very different opinion, or even a religion, right? And they have very different views from us. Are we mad at them? Would we be mad at them? It's like, okay. not really, right? Because it's like, why? Why, why are we not mad? Uh. It's because we assume that they must be different anyway. Because they're born in different cultures. They have, like, it's like, we are not surprised. We uh. expect them to be different. And therefore, when they show that they are indeed different, doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. I mean, we, we, we know that. Yeah. Oh, sure. You're right? Sure, yeah. sure. It's fine. I respect your view because mm-hmm. you know, you're, you're born in a different world from, from ours, right? Then let's take that and bring it to generations. When we talk to different generations, let's mm-hmm. say we are older generation, talk to young kid, younger generations, and we found that, hey, um, actually they think very different from us, right? We tend to get a little bit annoyed. <laughs> right? Yeah. Or right? even pick a fight with them. Like, yeah. hey. 
yeah, you got to think this way. How can you think like this, right? Yeah. Then why do, why do we do that? Why don't we do that to, to the person from England, from, from you know, France, yeah. from Ireland? But why are we doing that to, to our youth? Because we um, expect them to be the same as us. We expect us. them to be the same. And why do we expect them to be the same? Is because we think, hey, you are Thai. We are born in the same country, sure. same culture, right? Yeah. But then I, I did a, this exercise where I map out um, different generations, which Thailand they were born into. So when they're babies, when they go to school, uh -huh. um, when they start their first jobs, when they're building their careers, you know, from the kind of like the, the, the baby boomer, the X, the Y, the Z, the alpha. And what I found was, my God, it's like different country. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, it, for example, if you take um, um, someone who's kind of, I think, born 60s or something, 50, 50s probably, yeah. and, and they are they're the first time they, when they enter like kind of workforce, right, they just graduate from, from university and they find jobs. Thailand was growing, economy was growing like 7% mm -hmm. a year. Yeah. E economy was booming. It was kind of shifting from agriculture to manufacturing. I'm not saying it's easy for them. They had to work hard. Mm -hmm. But it's, the world is not changing that, that, that it's not shifting around like this. It's kind of like, you know, you work hard and you get to where you are. Yeah. And the growth opportunity is there. You just have to work hard, right? But if you are um, kind of born uh, uh, much later and you're like early 20s, right? And then you, you entered a market in say like 10 years ago, mm -hmm. um, you, you're, you're gonna find jobs at a time when the economy was growing on average about 3%, less than half of yeah. all that. Um, you have a lot of digital disruptions. Mm. Um, technology is changing, so you can be studying like all these things, your finance, all the things. And now all of a sudden, you're not really in demand anymore. Um, you have COVID. You know, you you work yeah. in the, the tourism industry. You want to do this, and then you got disrupted massively. Mm. Um, and, and so all of these things happening, right? Uh, then you, if you tell them that, hey, just work hard, stay work hard, and and keep at it, mm. and you get to where you are. Yeah. Same, like, old same old philosophy. philosophy, right? It's like, it's like no, I, I work so hard. Yet, you know, it's not my fault that there's a COVID. I work so hard to 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 go into hospitality. Mm. I work so hard to be in finance and got disrupted. Banking got disrupted. Mm. And all of these changes mm. and the economy, the opportunity is just not there. Mm. So you can empathize with both people who who the older generation who said you have to work hard. Why you don't have any kind of resilient and in grit, right? Yeah. You, you can understand with them because they're born in that age and that's how they got to where they are. Yeah. But you can also empathize mm. with the youth and say like, I did all of that and did none of them work because mm. for me, it, actually choosing which path to go can matters more than, than the work, right? If True. I choose the right industry, oh my God, I'm like, if you are working sustainably now, you're in demand, mm. it doesn't matter, mm. right? Where, where you are. So, so it, it's that kind of thing. And once you kind of map that out, you realize that, you actually born in different Thailand, different era. The world changed so much. Thailand has changed so much. It's a different era. What we need to have is the kind of open mindedness and empathy, the same way you have with the foreigners. If when you talk to your youth in your house, or you know, uh, my, my 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 kids, or the same way the other way, by the way, talking to your parents, uh, your grandparents, you have to realize that you're born in a essentially almost a different country, different society, different version. Mm -hmm. Um, and if you think, can think of them as just like a foreigners who would be living abroad, mm -hmm. the conversation might not be so contentious. You can be very different and you don't have to think the same way, yeah. but you can respect each other and mm -hmm. you can work with one another. So which do you think is harder for the young to reaching out to the old or the old to reaching out to the young? <laughs> yeah, it's a great question. Uh, I think both are difficult, but um, I do think that if... If, 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 we have, if we want to break the cycle of misunderstanding and lack of trust, mm. someone has to start, right? It's kind of like a circle. Someone has to start um, being a bigger person and say, okay, I'm going to be the, the bigger, bigger guy here. Uh -huh. um, I think it should be the adult mm. since they're accumulated more experience and yeah. wisdom uh -huh. uh, over the years, supposedly. <laughs> supposedly. <laughs> uh, so, um, and I think once... and. and to, be, to be, be honest, if you talk about organization, they tend to be in a position of power as well. Oh. Um, so they, they, it, it's really hard for an organization, team, community, uh, for, for if, if someone in power says, you know, I don't want this culture, you have to listen to me, this mm. is a top-down thing. Mm. It's really hard for, some, for someone junior to say, no, but you, know, you should listen to me, we mm. should have this empathy, it's like, no, right? Yeah. But if the boss set the example for the whole organization, 
that can set the culture. That makes sense. Yeah. And I think also, in some aspect, it's not just the age thing anymore. Not just the generation thing. For example, like let's take politics. Mm, mm. You can't just divide and say that okay, the young mm. like one thing and the adult would like other thing. Mm. It's not always like that. So, yeah, how do we resolve that? No, politics is much harder. So, in p o l i t i c project, I said first thing I said is like, hey, look, I'm I'm not doing, I'm not, I'm do, I'm looking at the generation gaps and stuff, mm. but I'm not really. Handling the political conflict because political conflict, as you said, is much more complicated. It's not just a generation thing. It's true that political conflicts in Thailand contributed to the generation gaps, and partly is exacerbated by the generation gap. So generation gap make, make it harder to talk to each other, mm. um, and the politics also add. So it's kind of like two ways, but it's not all about that. I have seen a lot of generational you know, conflicts. Which has nothing to do with politics at all. It could just be, you know, uh, looking at the news on social media mm. um, about, you know, pop star about some movies and just have different takes on it, yeah. right? Yeah, work be, ethics. Yeah, the yeah. ethics. All the it's all kinds of things. I think those things, this kind of empathy, uh, opening up to each other, can can help. Um, but politics is is harder because sometimes it's not just about that, but it's also kind of interest mm. involved. It's not just ideology. Yeah. Sometimes it's about interest as well. Sometimes mm. it's not just about um, hey, you know, uh, uh, the, where 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 you are ideologically, but it's about I'm losing out from this, right? Um, and it, it, it entails a lot of things like change. Mm. Sometimes the older generation, of course. They they have been living in certain way for for all their lives. Yeah. They they tend to like change less and less, right? Mm. I, I also notice that my, myself. Yeah. Uh, I like change less and less over time. Yeah. Uh, I like things more the same. Mm. Whereas for youth, um, the future, most of their life is still ahead of them, uh, and change is normal. And changes tend to favor them, so it's good. So they like change. Mm. Uh, a lot of older gen don't really like change that mm. much. So some of those things are just. Kind of different interests as well. Yeah. It's it's hard to it's align. It's a human thing, actually. It's right? human thing. Yeah, yeah. the nature of human. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, and Thai politics in particular is even more complicated than that. Yeah. Take one step further because it, it's all kinds of um, issues that have been accumulated: the social mm. divide, the economic inequalities, the inequality uh, in opportunities. Which let's not talk good into that, but yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I mean we can talk about this for another three hours. But yeah, yeah. now let's move on to the number three on your list, yeah, which yeah. is actually we we have touched a little bit on this yeah. subject before, like yeah. the opportunities. Yes. So how yes, do we yes. um, connect people with opportunities that they deserve to have, or there's an Inequality in the society, which mm. prevent them from from getting the same opportunities as others. Yeah, yeah. So this is um this is kind of the the economist in me, right? Thinking about the inequality problems, and I think the, the biggest problem in inequality is the inequality of opportunities. Mm. Um, you can have inequality of outcomes to some extent, right? Because if you are you're in a capitalism society, you're in a competition, so there'll be winners and there'll be losers. Um, so you can't. Eliminate the inequality somewhat, the outcomes uh, entirely. But what matters, I think, is the inequality of opportunities. Um, and what I mean by that is the opportunity to access, for example, good education. Uh, without having good education, it's very hard to to kind of empower yourself, your family, and get good jobs and and climb up the ladder, right? Um, Opportunities to access uh, some funding, financing. You might have great business ideas, um, and you could become very successful entrepreneurs. But if you can't access finance at all, then that's, you can't even start it. Um, so a lot of those things, and and I think there's a lot that can be done. Uh, I work in the past five years in a, a technology sector, and I do think that technology is a very important tool, a very powerful tool. Uh, it, it is also a double-edged sword. So on one hand, I see the positive side of it, where you can help people access um, different things, uh, opportunity much better. Like for example, you know, having access to different kind of uh, uh, in finance, for example, we do like a lot of people can access loans, can get loans much more easily because of technology, the data on them. People they don't have to put down their house, their cars. People can actually understand them based on their digital footprints, what they buy, what they do. Mm. Um, whether if say, say they're they're the sellers on uh, e-commerce uh, platforms, you know, traditionally they might be shut off. 
um, getting loans because it's like, oh, you don't have any collateral, you don't have the sal salary slips and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But in the tech world, you can say, no, actually, I know you are, you are, you're very successful. I can see from your sales. I can see your presence. I, I know all the behavior. I can use this and I can lend to you and you can become successful mm -hmm. uh, online uh, uh, sellers, right? Yeah. Um, it's true as in education as well. Uh, education, you can help having online education content um, can help a lot of people who want to reskill, want to change their life and later in life, they, they may not be able to have time to take time off to go to school. They still need to work to earn full time, but uh, online education make it much more flexible for them to yeah. kind of learn, adopt new skills, try mm -hmm. new careers. There's so many things like that. I think that technology can help. Yeah. So I think that's the part I'm passionate about, but also it, it works on the flip side uh, because if you have um, uh, different digital literacy and skills, mm. then it could also make inequality worse because those people without um, access to digital oh. technology or yeah. don't know how to use the digital tools, don't know right. how to use these apps, mm. it can be even worse, right? And we've seen that during COVID, like if you distribute money to help people through digital apps, but some of the people don't have access to digital, they don't know how to use it, they don't, don't get the help, mm -hmm. then that's problematic as mm -hmm. well. So I think this is where I think I'm, I'm a big believer in technology, but I think the technology has to go to the people rather than forcing people to come to the technology. I really enjoy our talk and I have been learning a whole lot and we have been talking about ideas and uh, thoughts. So my last question to you is what is going to be your next action. Right. What is the thing that you will do next here in Thailand? Wow, that's a very uh, good question. Um, I will spend a lot of time focusing on my family first um, because big change for them. I want to make sure I give them sufficient time uh, to adjust, you know, we're a house is still being built, our kids going to start a new school, we're adjusting everything. So of course, that's an immediate thing. But for me, it's really about, um, again, coming back to plan not to have a plan, to not be too committed, is to reconnect with uh, the Thai community mm. and thinking and asking always, what can I do? How can I help? And okay. what role can I play? Um, so you're community. not opening up your own brand or firm or no. company? No. No. Okay. No. Um, but so you will seek partnership? Is that it? Like I, working I, together with yeah. the right people? Yeah. 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 That, that's a part I think where I have learned about myself uh, is that I really enjoy working with the right set of people. That's really important to me. Some people, you know, it could be just PO impact contribution. Some people, it's about prestige and stuff. For me, it's about people I work with. So um, it can be many things, but if I have a chance to work with people I like, um, people I want to enable, I think that's really rewarding for me. So there are already some things that I'm, I'm doing, apart from the some advisory job, which I'm already doing abroad. In Thailand, I recently uh, founded a, a, I would say, a young leadership program um, that brought together curated uh, kind of young leaders uh, from different uh, uh, sectors together. Mm. Um, and we call it uh, the Change Maker Academy of Change Maker ACE, mm. um, and yeah, basically uh, it, it's it's a bit different from from other programs you see in the market because, as the name says, these are what what we think are the change makers, the one who's driving changes, right? Um, and I think they are in a stage where important transition stage for them because they're they're younger they're they're, they're, you know, they're they're rising up very fast in their rank to become leaders at a very young age very accomplished already but they are thinking about the next steps how do they create further impact how do they think how to take the next steps in life in their careers and everything mm. so we create this i would say a trusted uh, community of learning so they learn from each other mm. um, it is a safe space they can share their frustration they don't have to just talk about their success um, they can take off their, their hats and their hua kon and mm -hmm. come together as humans, as, as people, and get to know each other better and mm -hmm. support each other. Mm -hmm. So that's a program I'm doing. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, we have finished one batch. We are going to start a second batch soon. Uh, uh, this, for exa this is one example of things right. that I'm doing, and I'm really passionate about it. Yeah. I, I love doing it. It's just so rewarding. Yeah. But things like this mm -hmm. um, and more that I might discover mm -hmm. along the way. It sounds great. sounds very exciting. And please keep... Keep us posted. And if you have 
any story to tell, have any updates, feel free to drop by and have a talk with us. For sure. Oh yeah, yeah and I'm also writing a third book. Oh okay. Yeah, I forgot about that. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So any yeah. like um, preview? Uh, to this new book of yours? Some of the stuff we talked about. Um, so the very broad theme that I can share, I guess, is it's going to be a, putting together the lessons I've learned living abroad mm. and, and, and through my life to mm. different sectors, different careers. So try to Ooh. synthesize it, bring yeah. it in one. So and when can we expect this book? Uh, well, my editor expect me to <laughs> finish <laughs> end of this year and okay. the book should come out next year. Okay. Um, yes. And so I, early 2024. Work, work hard and, and okay. hopefully get to that. All right. And of course, we at the standard are looking forward to um, doing fun project with you, hopefully. Yeah, in the for future. sure. For sure. Yeah. So thank you so much for coming to the show. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. ล่วงอินไซต์เดอะสแตนดาร์ดเอคอนอเมิกฟอรัม2023 Future Ready Thailand เศรษฐกิจไทยไล่ล่าอนาคตรวมผู้นำระดับโลกและไทยกว่า40คนไว้ในงานเดียวพบกับเศรษฐาทวีสินบรรทุนล่ำซำเศรษฐพุทธสุทธิวาสนรพุทธสุรเกียรติเสถียรไทยสุปชัยเจียรวนนสุภวุฒิสายเชื้อกอบศักดิ์ภูตระกูลพยงศรีวนิชทัตยาอินทรวิชัยสมโพธิอาหุนัยธนาธรจึงรุ่งเรืองกิจฟาบริซิโอซาโคเน่พบกันวันที่23ถึง25พฤศจิกายน2566จัด3วันเต็มณศูนย์การประชุมแห่งชาติเศรษฐกิจซื้อบัตร Early Bird ราคา 2,500 บาทได้แล้ววันนี้ถึง31ตุลาคมเท่านั้น